Uh, so good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Sean Egan. I'm the director of transportation for the city. Uh, I want to take a, just a quick moment uh, and express my recognition and gratitude for uh, Bill Judge and Aaron Convery, who are here from the transportation team, um, who put together this presentation that you'll see this morning. So I think there's a real through line from the presentation that you got at the retreat two weeks ago with the resident satisfaction survey, where you saw time and again in the resident satisfaction survey, uh, a focus on sidewalks and sidewalk needs um, in that survey. Uh, what you saw earlier this morning with the community conversations was again, sidewalks uh, at the top of the list of concerns uh, for infrastructure, uh, the most uh, votes uh, in, uh, in favor of that being the highest priority. Uh, and I can tell you that that aligns very closely with what we in transportation hear when we're out in the community doing engagement activities. Sidewalks again and again uh, are top of mind for our residents, particularly residents um, in disadvantaged neighborhoods um, that have not had the benefit of public investment. Uh, in the past. And so uh, we're gonna talk just a little bit today about our sidewalk planning process, our needs identification, uh, our pipeline, um, and then uh, how this relates to the conversation on the infrastructure bond. Uh, so going back to 2006, we did the Durham Walks plan, it was effectively a vision plan for how we would approach pedestrian infrastructure uh, in Durham. Uh, we updated that in 2017 with our uh, bike and walk implementation plan, which was really focused on projects, uh, identifying specific projects, and then a prioritization method for those projects uh, to determine what the order of project delivery would be. Uh, one of the things that we learned through that process was that there were uh, aspects of that prioritization process uh, that didn't reflect the city's priorities and particularly uh, the city's focus on race equity. So race was not considered as a factor in the 2017 uh, bike and walk prioritization. So uh, with the city's work advancing on race equity, we came back in 2021 and actually gave the presentation that the mayor pro tem just referenced. Uh, and we uh, went back and put a race equity uh, criterion in the prioritization, and it really did shift uh, the order uh, of, of priority for investments, and, and we were very glad to be able to share that with the League of Municipalities. Uh, so uh, in 2023, uh, our colleagues in audit services uh, did a performance audit, uh, really looking at how we are doing, uh, how are we approaching, and how effective are we um, in managing and delivering um, sidewalk infrastructure for the city. And then uh, we're getting ready this year to do an update uh, to our bicycle and pedestrian plan uh, with our partners in Durham County. So one of the key findings from the performance audit was to look at uh, what is the pace, what is the rate of delivery of sidewalk projects in the city of Durham and how does that relate to all of our identified needs? Um, and you know, this really jumped out at us when we were reviewing the audit report. The idea that at our current rate of delivery of two and a half miles per year, uh, it will take us 170 years to uh, deliver the full inventory of needs. Uh, so that is the status quo. That's where we are today in terms of the needs that have been identified, uh, and the pace of delivery with the current resources that are available for sidewalk work. So what you see here is our pipeline. So these are the projects that uh, we've been working on really since 2017, since the bike and walk uh, plan was developed, implementation plan was developed. Uh, we've been working with our partners of the Durham Chapel Hill Carborough Metropolitan Planning Organization to identify uh, federal funding for this. We've gotten about a third of the value uh, of this uh, of the total project needs secured through 
either uh, federal funding available through the MPO or federal funding through competitive awards process uh, like the RAISE grant that is funding uh, the Durham Rail Trail project. And we're hopeful uh, with the vice president's support that uh, we'll get uh, another RAISE grant for um, our Holloway Street safe access to Durham's busiest transit route uh, later this year. So we've been working through that, uh, but there, there are significant uh, unfunded needs uh, in our pipeline. Um, and so this is sorted by where we are in the project phase. So we, we begin with planning, uh, which you see down at the bottom. We then move the projects into design. Once we've uh, advanced the design to the point where we know all of the property that'll be required, if there are any easements or other right of way that are needed, that's that ROW right of way. Uh, so any property that needs to be acquired to complete the project. So uh, the projects that are in the right of way phase are now, once all of that, uh, those property acquisitions are complete, will be ready for construction. So fortunately, several of those projects have a zero in that last column on the right. That means that uh, once we've completed all the right of way acquisition, we can move uh, into construction. However, as you can see, most of these projects, there's a number um, in that last column on the right. Uh, there's a shortfall uh, in our ability to complete uh, the funding package that's required for construction uh, of these projects. Um, and so that's how we get that 113 million at the bottom right corner there that you see uh, is uh, the total. Uh, so you know, as a result of the city's focus uh, on equity uh, and incorporating that equity lens into our prioritization process, what you see is that the locations of the projects that are identified on that previous slide uh, are spread across the city, uh, but they're disproportionately located um, in uh, census uh, tracks uh, with uh, higher shares of minority and low income residents. Um, so that equity lens is driving project selection and project prioritization uh, toward those uh, historically underserved communities uh, that have been deprived of uh, infrastructure investment in the past. Uh, so what that list uh, includes is 21 total projects. Uh, in many cases, uh, the, we, we bundle together a series of uh, sidewalk segments or sidewalk gaps uh, into one larger project. So if you uh, were to uh, look at all of the individual segments, we have about 41 corridors and gaps that are, in, that are bundled together into those 21 projects. Uh, that's 31 miles of new sidewalk. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, those projects are uh, in mostly in right of way and design with uh, one uh, with six segments that's uh, about ready to move into the design phase. Uh, so if you add up all the money that we've already secured in the CIP process, which is uh, 34 million, uh, and then that 113 of additional need, that's 147 million of uh, bond eligible uh, sidewalk improvement projects. Uh, so having uh, the infrastructure bond would effectively enable us to significantly accelerate the delivery of projects. Uh, so we would be able to complete the funding packages where you saw so many of those projects have a balance, uh, an unfunded balance uh, in that right column. Uh, that would uh, complete the funding package for those projects and give us some certainty uh, to move those projects uh, through final design, through that right of way process um, and uh, expedite uh, the construction process. And what we're seeing uh, in the construction market is very high rates of inflation. So uh, time is our enemy uh, with these projects. The longer we wait, uh, to tackle the projects, these sidewalk projects, with what we're seeing in, in double-digit um, construction inflation rates, uh, those costs are only going to go up. Uh, so that's why the, uh, the bond provides us this opportunity to, uh, 
to, to accelerate that rate of delivery so that we're not waiting 170 years to address our needs inventory. Uh, we can have the best prioritization process, but uh, without being able to increase that rate of delivery, uh, we're not going to be able to respond to, to most of the needs across the community um, in, the, uh, in the foreseeable future. So that uh, now that we've refined uh, and recalibrated that prioritization process, uh, this is a great opportunity uh, to move forward with uh, bringing the resources to bear for us to uh, scale up, accelerate the delivery of all the projects in that pipeline um, and uh, address those unmet sidewalk needs across the city. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Mayor Williams, Mayor Pro Tem Middleton, members of council, Manager Page. I'm Wade Walcott with Parks and Recreation. To give a little bit of background context and sometimes uh, maybe a reminder, I presented this about a year ago. Uh, and this came from this initiative came from a couple different plans. It was a previous comprehensive plan, but also a comprehensive aquatics plan. And these plans before us uh, took a look at our community, took a look at uh, surrounding communities and some of our benchmark cities, uh, specifically at, at aquatics and pools. And the number of pools and, uh, that communities have and populations similar to us. And so with those plans, we built upon uh, that information and took a look at what we have here in Durham. Some other knowns that we had at the time, uh, there was a shortage of pools on the east side of Durham. And what can we do about that to provide that kind of opportunity for our residents? We also knew that Longmeadow Park and the pool there was our one of our oldest pools. And through multiple consultants from years ago, it was at its end of its useful life. So we knew all that information and we wanted to start a project that we could help uh, address those issues. So the splash and play project started. That project included uh, Longmeadow Park, also East End Park, and then it came to, known as the, pro, uh, the property formerly known as Wheels. And we know we diverted a little bit from there. We focused, for good reason, a lot of attention on rehabbing the uh, roller rink. And that is underway. So with this project, one of the things we did was made sure uh, we did an equitable engagement uh, process. So of course, we worked with our friends in NIS, followed the blueprint, and, and built upon that as well. Our outreach and our engagement wasn't just come to us, we'll be here and tell us what you think. Our engagement was, was multifaceted, where we went into the community, we went to the neighborhoods, uh, we went to the community's events where people were already going to be to talk to them. Uh, we did uh, surveys, we did uh, a lot of other engagement opportunities to get as many people possible. One of the things that we're really proud of was it's not just the amount of numbers that we had engaged, uh, but that is important, but it was the quality of engagement we had. And, and I know that was something the previous council supported the last time I presented. So this is a really quick snapshot of that. Also, for those of you that weren't available uh, last year to be uh, present for this presentation, I'm happy to make myself available at your convenience to go through you know, more details about the process and how it led to all these findings. So one of the things this project looked at was, uh, what's our current site analysis? This is Longmeadow Park. You can see the ball fields here. Uh, the light blue, the light blue line is just the creek right there. Uh, the green line represents the R. Kelly Bryant Bridge Trail that goes through the park. This is also, uh, you'll see that funding request, I believe in one of Sean's plans with transportation as well. Uh, and you'll see the, the closed Longmeadow pool. The laser doesn't like this, the LED screen or whatever, I guess it is. So, but you can see the black spot with the pool. Yeah, there you go. So th that was the pool that we referenced earlier that we knew was beyond its uh, useful life. And this is the setting. Now, there's also a floodplain. And the blue line with the creek, the floodplain goes into most of, if not all, of the pool area. So that was problematic for several years. So our cons And so up north to the right there, that smaller piece in blue, thank you, that is East End Park as well. And so 
we're a hundred year old department. And of course we've made a lot of changes in a hundred years. And one of the things that started off a long time ago, these were segregated parks. So not only do we see an opportunity to, for improve aquatics, but to improve parks, but also to make some really historic connections. And we see this opportunity as a connection of connecting parks to the R. Kelly Bryant Bridge Trail. This is a rendering of what could be. So for Longmeadow Park, you can see the ball fields. You can see there's been some changes here off of Liberty Street. Uh, this is where the pool used to be in this large purple space. Again, that's not permanently purple, that's just a, a rendering. Uh, but this could be a more active, maybe zip line, more fun things to do for, for kids of all ages. Uh, this proposes Eva Street where a dead, line, or dead ends right there to be all the way through. We have the existing basketball courts and we have some exciting different play features to really activate this space. One of the things that most of us in this room know, um, the concepts of crime prevention through environmental design. So we know if we wanna reduce the opportunity for the nefarious and illicit behaviors that occur in some areas, how can we reinvest in our neighborhood parks? And how can we activate these as spaces where positive activity happens all the time? So that's what part of this presentation represents. Again, this is an overlay of our current analysis and site. This now is we get to uh, East End Park. The area around here, down here at the, this part of uh, Alston Avenue is the old uh, city-owned sign and signal shop. And then that's fenced off and then we get into the East End Park there to the right of the screen. And part of Easton Park is on the west side above there, uh, west side of North Alston. So that's current site analysis and taking a look at the features that we have here. And this will come into play in a little bit, uh, this piece right here. But you can see some openings there. You can see the green trail, the R. Kelly Bryant Bridge Trail running through. You can see that creek at the bottom and we see some opportunities. So we recognize that Longmeadow Pool uh, won't be operational anymore. And we knew that for quite some time. Again, that's why we, we started this study. Through our study and through our outreach and community engagement, you know, having some sort of aquatic opportunity or pool is, is very important to the residents. We found a spot, which is for reference, the piece up there on the top. Yes, thank you. Uh, is this area right here where we propose a, a neighborhood pool opportunity right here across the street. Then you'll see the pool up on top of the screen right there on the other side of Alston. And this is a rendering of what could, what could be. Again, how do we make this space more inviting, more welcoming for all, all abilities? What kind of fun things can we do so there's positive behaviors going on in the park? There are other opportunities that we can look into as far as just like some of these great amenities. Uh, there's opportunities where we could consider type, different types of kiosks for the community. Those can mean a million different things. There could be you know, food opportunities, but these kiosks could be just basic structures that perhaps we could look at uh, if residents in the area may have mobility issues or transportation problems, and they have a hard time maybe coming to certain city facilities to pay utility bills or permits or whatever. What if there was a kiosk there that we could staff every so often that people in the community could come just to the neighborhood park? Maybe this is a, a vibrant hub now of activity, of positive ac uh, activities, but also a place where they could get some resources and get some help as well in their own neighborhood. And this is just another angle of East End. You can see the pavilion uh, up to the top right screen. That's a, a rendering of the, of the existing structure from the old sign and signal shop that perhaps we could be efficient, keep that structure and have it for indoor or you know, overhang activities, whether that's basketball or, or, or pickleball or, or what have you. A lot of different options there. Now moving on, so that was Longmeadow East End of what is now and what could be. And the other piece, the driving part of this from the uh, comprehensive aquatic plan was we need not just a neighborhood pool, but a larger pool that's a regional draw that's there for the entire community. And that was one of the, the driving factors when we purchased this, this property here. Again, we mentioned uh, the upfitting is underway here for the roller rink. 
this is obviously a current shot. Right across the street here on Hoover is our newest uh, beautiful park, Merrick Moore Park. And, and so this was a location where we identified to build a larger regional pool for our community. So here is what is now, and here's what could be. But you can see the skating rink at the top there. We have some park amenities in between the skating rink and the pool, some lawn space, and you can see a great vision. Now, all these amenities, these weren't done in a silo or in a vacuum where we said, what would we like? Again, I wanna emphasize the amount of engagement that we, we did with our community, and th this is a result of that. Even before this, we had three different options that we went back to the community, and this, this is uh, one of the ones, this is the one they, they picked. To have these kind of amenities, we wanted something for uh, small youth and families, but something that's a draw for teens as well. And that piece was, was this area right here. This was a big hit because it has that element of risk, right? It looks fun. Everyone in here wants to do that right now, I know. So that was kind of option that we wanted to, to piece into here as well. These are a couple of different angles to give you a sense of what a great space this can add to East Durham. Again, Merrick Moore Park, the, the newest develop is on the top of the screen, right across the street. There's a great opportunity for youth, for family, for teens, for youth of all ages. Again, so there's elements that we can do, still do some swim lessons there, but maybe if you can see in the middle, there's tiny little rings. Maybe that's a ninja obstacle course that goes over the pool. Uh, so there's a lot of different options. What, one of the things we really liked here was having a zero depth entry for everyone and having some play features right there in the, in, in the middle. Lazy River was a very popular uh, request as well. So just one other angle of what could be uh, this could be, again, maybe it's the kiosk, maybe it's a concession area, maybe it's, it's a multi-use facility. Uh, and then we have a little bit of a pavilion there behind that green space. So really, again, a vibrant hub of community activities uh, for, for all abilities and for all ages. And just when it's, if it's not summertime, it's not pool season, that's okay. This doesn't become boarded up and nowhere to go. This is a park still. And even in our, in our warmer days before the pools open or our warmer days after the pools close, we propose a spray ground here. And we have a, a playground and, and activity space here as well. So this is something, this is gonna be one of, the, one of the best parks that we have in all of Durham right here. So this is the this was the cost estimate about it was yeah just about a year ago when we last presented this so I'm sure some adjustments will need to be made uh, but this includes both parks and both projects I, I showed you today. Oh, well, <clears throat> that was um, it's quite something. <laughs> Well, good. Uh, can you can can we open tomorrow? As long as we can open up the checkbook. No, thank you. Um, and just personally speaking, I am so tired of Carrie and Raleigh uh, outdoing us on this front. So uh, I, it's time to really pony up. So um, thank you. Okay, I am Tim Flora. I'm your finance director. Uh, and looking at time, I will. Um, there's a, several slides here. Uh, we'll use some of those slides as reference so we can get to the point where you, you have questions. And I know um, most of your questions probably will be for those projects themselves. Uh, I will say by starting off, I do feel a little bit like the guy at the uh, car dealership. Um, you've got someone out there on the lot showing you all this cool stuff. And then um, you, you come into the showroom and then th th they stick you with the finance guy to tell you about how you can afford all of that. And so, uh, uh, I, so I, I, I don't know, we'll, we'll do the best we can uh, with this information as well. Uh, I do want you to sort of understand though, when it comes to, um, uh, when, it, when it comes to the finance side of things, 
while all of the departments and budget and the community and you on council are in the kitchen grinding the sausage, uh, us finance folks, we are sitting over, over there on the side uh, counting the beans uh, while this process is going on, as well as we're also looking out the window, making sure that the city manager uh, pages uh, 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 money tree is uh, continuing to grow. So, uh, but I, I did feel like before we started this discussion uh, about the, the municipal bond or, or the uh, bond referendum, general obligation bond referendum, uh, I, I sort of need to give you a little bit background on debt um, because the city has an, a, a large amount of debt. And so I want you to get comfortable with the fact that debt is a thing for local governments. It is not a bad thing. It is a good thing. It is, it is the way that we can accomplish the things that we want to accomplish. It's the way that we can increase the capacity in our investment in the community. And so, but under also understand that debt really is uh, one of our, uh, it, it is the major funding strategy for our capital assets. Um, and so um, it helps us deliver uh, infrastructure when it is needed. Um, it spreads the cost over the useful life of the asset. And from my standpoint, it's also, there's an intergenerational equity component to it. It's the, the generation that is going to receive the benefit from that asset is also helping to pay for that asset. So um, there is a very important uh, reason for uh, the use of debt. Uh, we have, uh, I think about $1.6 billion of open capital projects through all of the different capital ordinances that we have. And so I just pulled out the top two, which is our uh, enterprise water and sewer uh, capital fund, as well as the general CIP project ordinance fund. And uh, this really is just to sort of uh, represent, these are the two largest, I think they represent about $1.4, $1.5 billion worth of projects that we currently have open um, that are ongoing. And so I wanted to sort of show you the spread of, uh, of debt and the use of debt in these projects. So where we can, we do try to find other funding sources, whether it's uh, the PAYGO, which is uh, from the debt fund, it's the, it's the revenue that we have in reserves, whether it's grants, whether it's impact fees. Uh, we uh, inter, uh, intergovernmental, so money we get from the county as well. So, uh, but you'll see uh, debt is the majority of the funding um, for these projects, which is why we want to have this discussion on uh, the general obligation bond. This is, again, just for point of reference, this is all the different types. So there are many different types of debt that we use, the general obligation bonds, the referendum. That's what we're going to talk about mostly today. Um, that, uh, from my standpoint, really is the ultimate in community engagement because that is uh, where we engage the community, where the voters actually vote uh, on uh, this debt. They, they vote for the use of, of, of this debt. Um, and general, general obligation bonds are really secured by the good faith and taxing authority uh, of, of the government. Whereas uh, the others, revenue bonds, those are mostly used for our enterprise funds, which is uh, funded by the revenues, uh, the fee revenues that they generate, or limited obligation bonds or installment debt, which is secured by collateral, what you're financing or other collateral that you have. And so, uh, the one thing I would like to point out from this slide is that uh, by the end of FY24, we are approaching uh, the $1 billion mark, uh, our, debt, our debt portfolio. Um, at the end of this year, we anticipate having about $987.7 million of outstanding debt. That is both uh, governmental and, and business. I also want to point out, um, well, let me just, th this is uh, future, this is what we're projecting based upon uh, what we've got in the CIP. Uh, this is uh, just the, the slide before, just to sort of give you an idea of where we have been. So from 2014 to the current day, 2024, and then where we're projecting forward of, of what our outstanding debt service is for governmental and business type. Um, so now I'm just sort of pivoting. We're now just really going to talk about governmental, uh, the, the, the geo referendum type step, but just uh, uh, to let you know that 95, uh, million dollar bond. We are just now this spring starting to go out for that money. So while the projects have been ongoing, we've been able to fund a lot of those with uh, current proceeds and so um, or, or current funds that we've had. But now we're at the point where we need to uh, start uh, making a draw. So we're going out in two tranches. Uh, so uh, here soon in the next a few months, you'll be hearing uh, from me uh, at a council meeting where we will be moving that forward. And we're going after our first tranche of $54 million in May. 
of this year, and then uh, we expect to get the the balance of that forty one million dollars sometime in FY twenty six. Uh, we just completed uh, 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 a lot a limit obligation issuance uh, last year for one hundred thirty eight million dollars. So so debt is a perpetual thing. Um, we are always going after. We're always looking at um, you know when the timing of this debt is. And so I think this might be a good time really to sort of walk you through some of the debt. So again, interest rates seems to be a, a topic uh, that comes up. And so understand that uh, our debt, because we are a AAA government, um, we have, uh, we get really good rates. Um, and so we have interest rates. I think if I were to look at uh, governmental, our governmental debt, I think we have something some, somewhere along the line of 36 different government uh, debt issuances that we've got out there that we're, we're actively managing. And the interest rate on those right now is anywhere from 0.9% all the way up to 5%. So the, the last issuance we did was at 5%. Um, but our average is we're right around 3.9%. So that's the interest rate that we get, uh, um, that we are, uh, that we are paying. And so that's, that's, you know, in today's market, it's not what you're, you're getting when you're buying a house, which is, is much higher. Because of our AAA, the type of debt that we issue, um, interest rates are, are significant lower. Now, and I will also say on a side note, this is just sort of a, a side note, um, where interest rates are higher in this world, we're also getting uh, higher uh, returns on our investments. And so where in the past few years, several years, actually, uh, we've not been receiving any uh, really interest revenue. Uh, today, uh, we, we can actually say we're averaging, I think, right around 4, 4.4% on our investment portfolio. And just as a uh, as a heads up, uh, our investment portfolio at the end of last month was about $600 million. Now, I will say that's not $600 million available for you to spend. That is $600 million that is already obligated. But what we do is we have a really good cash flow model. And so while we are sitting on that money, we are going to get every little uh, investment dollar we can out of that. And so that, when you look at that, our investment portfolio is really also offsetting our, uh, our, our debt interest rate as well. So while we're paying, maybe paying a little bit higher in interest rates, we're also getting, uh, it's being offset by our um, in investment revenue. Uh, this is just uh, principal uh, payments. We don't need to talk about that. This is just a little bit about our capacity. Again, we have the debt fund. Uh, that gets 11 cents or 11 and a half cents when you include our equitable and green programming. And so while uh, you may have seen in this last slide while I flipped through it that uh, we are anticipating our debt service to go up to $45 million next year, uh, all that is leveled out through our debt service fund. And so it, it, it's being funded by that 11, 11 and a half cents. And so we level out those years. So you don't really necessarily see the impact on the budget for our debt service payments. So the general obligation bond referendum. And so this is really what we're uh, here to talk about. Uh, and so it really is the primary source of funding for infrastructure projects. Um, it's, it's a really cool tool for very expensive projects because we can sort of carve those out um, and, uh, uh, and set those aside and fund them specifically so that they're not, they're not taken away from, from other resources. Um, the funding really is over periods of five to 30 years. So um, you, you've got a lot of flexibility there on the type of projects. Again, I mentioned before, it's secured by the full faith and credit of the city, our taxing authority. And uh, what it makes this unique from others is this is something that is approved as part of a referendum by the voters. So the voters actually get to vote um, uh, on whether or not we can go out uh, for this type of debt. Um, and uh, one very important factor is that any bond funds, and it, it really, you, you can't do it with any kind of debt. You only use debt for capital. You cannot use debt to pay for operating expenses. Um, I will point out some considerations uh, as we consider a bond referendum. Um, understand that uh, they are separate ballot questions, so they're separate buckets for the different types of projects. Um, so, like we had you come, uh, the, the folks that came up and presented, that would likely be the different buckets that we would, if we were to go out for a referendum for all those, those those would be the buckets that the voters get to vote on. So they they we have to be very clear about what the voters are voting on. So they it's not like we're just voting on an entire package. They are voting specifically on uh, the specific types of debt. Um, 
you want to be careful um, with what you want to put on these referendums because understand that uh, the voters are voting on it. And so it should be something that is uh, needed uh, and that the voters will get behind um, because it becomes a little awkward if the voters uh, don't vote for it and you still need it. Um, and then you've got to figure out now, how are you going to fund it? Um, and so uh, that is one of the considerations you need uh, to take. Um, and uh, uh, geo bonds are really good for those projects that you normally can't collateralize. So sidewalks is a really good example. It's hard to use a sidewalk as collateral for a limited obligation bond. And so this is a good way of paying for that infrastructure that, that you, you really get, you can't use this collateral for something else. So how do you identify projects? Well, we're sort of going through that process now. So I think last year we, we sort of started the discussion um, and, and you know, over the course of the last year, we've been working with the departments, we've working with the community, been working with council as to trying to identify those needs. You bring them back, you put together, this is exactly what we're doing now. We're having this discussion. And now it's a matter of how do we prioritize this stuff? Do we want to, do we want to move forward with it? Is the timing right? Um, and so, uh, so that's kind of what we're, we're, we're doing now. We're sort of making that sausage. Um, so this is uh, the placeholder cost. So uh, Council Member Rist, I know you were asking and you were right now, these numbers are not exactly the numbers they gave because uh, at one point I just sort of had to stop and take a, a snapshot. There were some costs, uh, uh, there were some costs in some of those projects that we had already identified did not qualify for a geo bond funding. And so, so these are, they're in the ballpark as to what the total cost is. Again, affordable housing, we already have, have that, so that is not in the mix. But you'll notice that even my number, uh, 610 million, uh, or 610 million dollars, uh, is is a big number. Uh, this is just sort of usually what happens is there is a consequence to voter referendum, which means it typically it, these projects have to be paid for some way, which ultimately means our taxing authority, which means a tax rate increase. And so this would be sort of the impact in $100 million increments. Uh, I will say uh, the rate increase is probably on the extreme side. I think that is just based upon 20 years. Some you can stretch out longer than that, shorter. And as well, uh, I think that probably is not level principal payments, but just level payments themselves. So, uh, but this is sort of a snapshot of this is the impact. Uh, the next slide would be, this is the impact that would you would see on our actual debt service. And so the blue is what we actually have now. The yellow is what we would add on already for the affordable housing bonds. And then the red would be, so the red is only based upon $300 million of additional um, costs. And so you can see uh, with that $300 million, it, it almost doubles um, the debt service that we would we would have. Um, and so I, I just arbitrarily used $300 million. I couldn't get the chart to fit on the, uh, <laughs> on the page, so. <laughs> Exactly. Um, so, um, so I was building my presentation based upon the PowerPoint size. Uh, so, um, just to give you some uh, background, these are the, the 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 bond referendum history that the city has done: ninety-five uh, million on affordable housing, which was done, and then uh, the prior years, just to give you a size and just for comparative. Um, here's the last two of Durham County. They had some pretty sizable bond referendums. Um, they also have schools, so, but just, just for comparative purposes, those are there. Um, and then this really is just the calendar. Uh, it's more for your reference, uh, which there would be council actions, but uh, there is a very specific timeline that we would have to go through uh, in order to get this approved um, and on, uh, on the ballot uh, for this fall. And so there are many steps. Uh, I will also note there are some dates in January that would re require council action. I think we easily could move those uh, to August, knowing full well that we do not have um, council meetings uh, in in July. So uh, with that, I tried to go as quick as I could so uh, we could ha have some time. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm actually even a little bit over. Uh, but uh, if you have questions or for the team. Yeah, yeah and I, I would say all of the presenters, if you go, could just come back up because um, we're going to have questions. 
comprehensively here. How much time are we allowing for questions? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I have a lot of questions. I mean, but we're talking six hundred million dollars, so I hope we have time for questions. Yeah, let's. Yeah. We'll, we'll ask whatever questions you have. Let's, because uh, we're gonna our lunch will be here uh, shortly. We're gonna take a break, get lunch, come back, and work through lunch. So, so we have. So we have till. Right. I know. Yeah, I, I'm not gonna put a. I, okay. I'm not going to say we have 10 minutes for questions. I want us to be able to have a good conversation around it. Um, but we'll try not to be here all day in question. <laughs> um, but we're, we're going to have, we're going to take a break. I may stop us while as, asking questions, get our lunch, come back, and continue working. So, uh, Kessler, pick up a year. Do we want to go like, like section by section or just each I'm person? Just gonna go, so I will own that I am further along and where I'm at with my questions is because this is not new information for me in some cases. I have a couple of technical questions for you. Can you do a mixture? Because you're saying that things like sidewalks, parks, and whatever the other example you gave are better for uh, general general obligation because they're not collateral, where it's kind of like the police station, the ballpark, and um, CPAC. Those were all limited obligation bonds. They were not general general, whatever, the GOB versus the LOB, general obligation versus limited obligation. Is there also the ability to do a mixture for something like that? Like if you're trying to think of your overall package and you're trying to manage all of it, which is essentially the end of your slides, it's like how do we manage um, our debt to income ratio is essentially what we're doing, which is what we have to do as a household, right? You're applying that same strategy to the city can you do a combination is one question. Yes, I think you, you, you absolutely can. And so what I would say is as we would get closer to identifying that, yes, this is something we want to move forward, forward with, we would then go back with our financial advisors, our bond council, and try to figure out what would be the optimal uh, package. The optimal package for okay. that, yes. And then obviously, and this is just speaking to me, you know, the total of these things is a, is a massive amount of, of money. I know part of that then becomes about staff capacity. Um, I know our county has worked towards moving towards, for schools in particular, because there's always going to be that need. They're trying to move to a schedule. And so that's my other question for y'all is as you're thinking about these things, is just moving us to a schedule. I know other municipalities do it um, yes. because I think that that's probably a best financial practice as well. Yes. So, so as we would, so that would be something I think we would also look at. Um, I, I think the city of uh, Charlotte does it, Raleigh. Yes. Yeah. They, they all sort of every other year. There's... Right. Because if we go to the slide at the end, which shows where you didn't have enough space, um, Right. So I can see, you know, obviously from a financial perspective, you know, 2027, we're getting into some stuff, but then we have right. a lot more capacity later years. Yes. And so then if we can track what what we know is coming to what our capacity is, then we can actually get on a schedule. And that just helps inform voters as well. Right. OK, so I guess that's my request is is as we dig into this. And I know that Wanda and I have had so many conversations um, and she's really just been really great at at, you know, a lot of us don't enter these seats knowing any of this stuff. So I just want to highlight for staff that this is excellent information. I think those are my requests. Right. This is not a once and done type of right. situation, you're, right? You're we, gonna, it takes a while to, to learn it. Right. Um, but then, yeah, at some point, kind of modeling that future for us so that as we're trying to figure out what do we even put on a bond, we can see what the best decision is for now, what's really actually ready, and then what do we really need to think about would be ready in a few years. That's all. Thank you. Right. One, and I will say one of the things that for, for consideration is, you know, those projects, LGC is, they like shovel ready type projects. Yes. Council member Rist. Sure. Uh, first question for Mr. Egan. Um, so first of all, thanks for the exciting presentation on sidewalks. And, and you know, in many ways, as, as uh, my colleague, Councilmember Baker, was saying, we've heard from citizens in many different ways, and sidewalks is one of the things they ask for all the time. So appreciate the presentation. My question is is about, like, the numbers and the operations, right? So we received a report. Actually, I wasn't a council. I think this happened before previous council. 
Audit Services did an audit of the of the um, sidewalk repair and construction, right? So I know the recommendations in there about making the delivery of new sidewalks and repair more efficient. So to like, how does the cost for sidewalks interact with the sort of like operational changes that's been recommended by by the Audit Services Committee in terms of like getting that done? How does that all fit together? So there were several different recommendations included in that audit report. Uh, one of them uh, was to uh, for the city to look at how we deliver uh, sidewalk projects as capital projects, if there are some best practices that we can learn from peers across the industry. So we've incorporated the scope uh, of that into the update that we're doing to the bike and walk plan this year so that we do that outreach and we collect information about what are the best practices in delivery of sidewalks. The, the more efficient, the quicker we can be, the less cost there is. Um, there are also recommendations in there about consistent funding levels for sidewalk maintenance. Um, so there are sidewalk maintenance requests, I think, in your general CIP. Uh, so uh, there having the city have a, a consistent program for sidewalk maintenance is really critical to be able to meet the state of good repair needs of that. Um, and those funding levels have fluctuated in the past. And so that was one of the findings of, uh, of that audit report was uh, the, the need for there to be consistent funding for sidewalk maintenance uh, because we have a, a large inventory of sidewalks to maintain um, and then also for us to look at more efficient and effective ways to deliver new sidewalks. But I imagine, and this is also, it's not just your department, right? There's, this is an interdepartmental challenge, right? So I imagine that probably rolls up to the city manager at some point, making sure all the different relevant departments are working together to make this as efficient as possible. Great, thanks. Should I keep going or? Anyone else here? Do we want to just do sidewalk questions and then oh, move on? We or? have the whole team available, so whatever questions you have. I mean, but since he's up here. A minute. Cool. I have a really brief sidewalk question while you're up here. Also, great tie. Um, I just was curious about, you talked about, like, the three different stages that these projects are in, and I was just curious about the timeline between those, like, how we get from planning to design, like, how long those generally take. <laughs> Uh, so, I mean, the projects that you're seeing in our pipeline, um, those are coming from the 2017 plan, uh, and in many cases, in some cases prior, like the, uh, the Durham Rail Trail, we did our master plan in 2014, uh, and we're still working on the design of that project. So depending on the complexity of the project, the rail trail is, we had to purchase a railroad bed, and that has to be torn up and uh, we have to do a whole new trail for that. Uh, that project is gonna require a lot more time for planning and design and right-of-way acquisition than uh, a sidewalk uh, along the existing right-of-way. Uh, but what you see is that we're, most of the projects that are in this pipeline have been in this pipeline since that 2017 mm -hmm. uh, bike and walk plan. So it takes a long time. That's a function of project complexity, uh, but it's also a, a function of resources. Uh, so staff capacity to manage uh, funding for uh, contracted services for things like design and right-of-way acquisition. Uh, to the extent that those are limited, uh, it limits uh, how quickly those projects can move. And just as a follow-up on that, and forgive me if you said it, but you talked about this approximate 31 miles of new sidewalks, um, given the amount of money the what was the 147.4 mil? Um, how did you come up with that number? Like what is the timeline for that 31 miles number? So as uh, one of the requirements of the bond is that all of these projects would need to be completed within seven years of issuance of the bond. So when we looked at our pipeline, uh, we looked at projects that uh, we were confident could be delivered within that seven year time frame, And those are projects that are either uh, at, the, at the very end of the planning about to go into design or in the design or right away uh, process. The, the planning level projects, uh, we, we are not confident uh, that those would meet that seven year requirement. Thank you so much. And like Councilmember Caballero, I'm, I'm gonna 
reserve most of my time or yield most of my time for my colleagues, newer colleagues to have questions. Just a quick uh, comment. Um, first off, thank you so much for the presentation. I'll just you know self-identify. I'm I'm debt averse while I respect the power of debt and well use debt. It's a necessary thing for cities to do. Um, so he, here's just the, the things I'm going to be bringing to this discussion considering this. I, and I'll say right up front, I am more likely to support um, doing the bond um, either next year or after that, and I'll tell you why. The, the most important thing I think facing us now that we've telegraphed to the public is that we're going to do a, a significant adjustment to our pay for our employees, which is almost certainly going to require a tax increase. Um, so the question is, is there going to be a tax increase connected to that and this as well? And if I had to array the two, this, because it, it's more strategic, it's long term. So one question for me is, how fast are we going to speed up projects in reality? I know I, someone said that we, we, we could, you know, accelerate it, but how much is that acceleration? If we float the debt, is the bang that we get for that debt um, so uh, dramatic that we have to do it this year as opposed to next year? Because I know this year, for me, and I think for the city, the, uh, the, the massive adjustment to pay for our employees is going to be what's primary. So that, for me, is a good enough reason to, to not act on this this year. Secondly, uh, the, the secret to the success, not so much secret, but the, the well-known secret to the success of the housing bond was the education campaign that went along with it. Um, we had a lot of explaining, a lot of public engagement. Um, and I'm wondering, do we need that same type of time to explain? It's going to take 170 years to the public to get to where we need to do if we, if, you know, if we're doing it at our current rate. But in the meantime, we are spending money differently. Some of those communities that have been historically disinvested are now getting quicker uh, attention now, even without a bond issuance. So while we, we're spending money differently, we've got an equity lens on it, um, is it really going to, to put us in, in a, you know, a dramatically worse position if we did this next year? as opposed to this year. But I just want to put out there that if we do do this this year, we're going to be doing this and also looking at perhaps a significant tax increase for our salary adjustment and floating debt. And the question for me, and I'll end with this, the question for me is if we float this debt now or make a decision now, is the speed up, is the, the, the return or the acceleration of projects is it really that much different than our current um, posture with our CIP? And, and you know, each council member has to make their own decision on that, but we're going to be raising taxes for that salary increase, at least I think, uh, as well. So thank you, Mr. Mayor. So uh, I'll speak to just quickly, uh, as the audit report pointed out, we're at a pace of about two and a half miles per year uh, of new sidewalk. Uh, what you see there is 31 miles over the next seven years. So that's about four and a half miles per year. So it's almost doubling the rate of delivery, uh, which would take that 100. If we were to really double that, would take that 170 years down to 85. And I did just want to sort of jump in and, and say, so this really, we are beginning this process. And so, yes, uh, if this goes uh, to a referendum, yes, there would be some probably uh, community engagement on the impact of that, but and not until after the referendum and the vote is taken would there be really any tax impact. Um, so that would that would happen in a future cycle. Uh, yeah, thank you for your presentation. Um, this is the number one question that I always receive: is is how do I get a sidewalk and and how do we get more sidewalks? Um, there. Are, the, the two largest um, killers of residents in Durham are, are guns and, and traffic accidents, and, and traffic accidents are, are largely due to um, the design of, of, of the public realm and the design of our streets. Um, so that's one thing I want to just say is considering construction of sidewalks um, holistically within the entire public realm, street trees bearing power lines, um, the the width of the width of the pavement of of uh, veh vehicular space. Um, so, so I think getting that right too, and making sure that that we have good direction on 
what the uh, cross sections of our streets, recognizing that a lot of these streets and, and where we construct sidewalks will have limited right of way space, but making sure that, that the, the direction on that is clear. Uh, one, one quick question I had, just uh, what, what's the current cost uh, per linear foot of, of sidewalk right now? And has that increased significantly? So we're seeing costs um, in the neighborhood of uh, $800 to $1,000 per linear foot. So if you do the math on that, it's about five million a mile. Uh, we used to see, you know, a million, a million and a half seemed high to us in the old days, uh, but we're seeing much higher costs per linear foot uh, for sidewalk construction now than we have uh, in the past. Can you go back to the slide of how much we uh, invested in sidewalk since 2010, I believe? million or 25 miles over 10 years this is this is this is all future looking the audit was um was looking at at delivery of miles per year so 25 miles over 10 years uh it didn't um uh, the cost per mile uh for those was considerably less than what we're seeing looking right. ahead yeah so this is what's coming right so I was look, and there was also a slot of what we have done. Yeah. So that that was this, uh, and there's there's more detail on this in the um, in the audit report. But this was looking at the really focused on the rate of delivery. Okay. Okay. Um, what do we have next? Oh. Happy to pass the mic. Um, I thank you so much for this presentation. I I just um, didn't realize how close to tears I could get looking at uh, designs of water parks. But um, yeah, we we talked about. I think someone said earlier that um, this is a thing that we are. Durham is really missing, and I don't mean just in, in comparison to other cities, but like our Durham residents really deserve spaces like this, and um, and I've seen spaces like this in other cities, and the use that the community gets out of them is just, I don't think we can even put a, a number on how valuable that is to our community. So thank you so much um, for all the work that y'all did developing these plans. Um, my questions, which probably are going to sound really an, uh, annoyingly repetitive, are again about timeline. I'm just curious about what, um, yeah, I mean, y'all have clearly like had several designs. You've, you've sort of chosen designs based on community feedback. Um, what, it, what are timelines that we're looking at for these, these projects? I think uh, Tim mentioned earlier that uh, obligation bonds are usually attractive if they're shovel ready. And so this is definitely an example of that. So we do, like you mentioned, we do have some conceptual designs. We are working right now um, to do some more schematic design um, in review of the former wheel site for that, that pool. So that's kind of like environmental studies and things like that. Um, but yeah, I, I can't say with real good certainty of like all things lining up perfectly when that happens, but I, if if we had the funding today and we used to go through contracting processes and and those kinds of things, I don't think the projects themselves, let's say the the pool area out at the form at Merrick Moore, I mean that would probably be the two two to three year process, um, but that's subject to change. So somewhere around that, but we're not talking ten years or anything like that. Thanks, Mr. Walcott. Great presentation. Um, I know so much of government work can feel like sort of like it's sort of the slog, you know. Thanks for bringing the, the the fun and the play into our conversation. Appreciate that. By the way, I should say this shameless plug. I know you've hired a muralist to do a mural at the at the at the wheel at the at the rink there, or the whole wheel site. Yes, yes. And uh, working with the, the the art folks and general services, yeah, there's a public mural going on in there. So we have pictures of kids at a, at a at a birthday party playing roller hockey in the old rink there. So I'm, I'm going to insert that into the process. Okay. Uh, there's some good stuff there. Anyway, my one question: If you could go to the to the um, to the the images of the wheel site and what that's going to look like in the future, 
My only question is, yeah, that, that's a good one right there. My only question is like, it seems like at that site, and this is a super exciting project, seems like there's a lot of space of this, of the whole parcel devoted to parking for cars, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm not a transportation planner. I looked at my colleague, um, Council Member Baker, but is there is there another way to do parking there so you can accommodate cars, but not have so much of the space taken up by a parking lot and impervious surface? That, that's my question. I'm sure there's options. Again, this is just conceptual, and this is just one of the renderings. I think one of the considerations at the time was um, what it, what it could look like in terms of flow. Could you actually go to this one, please? Sure. And so, yes, is, there's lots of different options we can explore. I think one of the ideas was looking at the entrance on the on the top there, and then creating another one here. This in terms of flow, as far as maybe buses of kids and groups of people could easily flow in and out. Um, but there, yeah, there's different options we could do. Uh, perhaps maybe it's not just parking. Perhaps it's another activity that uses a paddle. Uh, Baker. Sure. Um, I just wanted to take a look at the 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 uh, demographic uh, slide, just because the numbers there are kind of shocking um, when we look at changes between 2010 and um, looks like we're using ACS data. Um, those changes are pretty dramatic in 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 those places, and um, just wanted to acknowledge that and recognize that um, some communities have have gone uh, decades without investment. And once they start receiving investment, um, they undergo displacement and uh, and something to, to keep in mind as, as we look at all of our infrastructure um, investments. Um, parks, um, one thing that you mentioned is, that really excited me was uh, kiosks and parks. I think there's a major opportunity with kiosks, kiosks and parks. And, and these ones that we're talking about in uh, parks, parks across the city, um, both for um, you know, fun purposes, and also um, in order to to allow access to city services uh, close close to to our residents. So I think that that's really important. Um, East End, uh, can you just speak to? I know East End is is one of these parks um, where some toxins were found in the park. Can, can you speak a little bit to how um, the money that would go toward redevelopment of East End would also it like is. Where is remediation coming in into play uh, when it comes to East End and those, those other parks? Separate from what is proposed as this project would be funded through a bond, uh, remediation would be looked at separate from a separate funding source. Okay. Okay. That's not included here. That's that's something completely Correct. different, completely different bucket. I should okay. say that was in the there was there's five million in the CIP for next year that would be the I, remediation yeah. piece. Yeah. Uh, colleagues, thank you all so much for this, uh, these questions, and um, I thank you all. The top line. Um, so this process would work sort of kind of in tandem with this budget process, because I think you, utilizing this budget process to, if you all decided you wanted to move forward on um, a referendum, it would be helping us to narrow down what those uh, those items are and then again it's not really part of this budget process it would be um getting the go ahead to begin the process and so i think i think uh if you go yeah so by we would need some kind of cancel act council action in june uh, to get to this ball rolling which is where we would start the application process with the local government commission um, and start checking all of the compliance requirements and so if this is something that you know, that, that we want to move forward with as we work through decisions on our current CIP and what we want to carve out as part of a referendum. This is where um, in the next in the next few months we would need to make those kind of final decisions so that we can then really pull the trigger on whether or not this is what we want to do this year or or not. So if I jump in, so so in terms of this uh, applying to LGC, for example, so how much, so what are they, like how much information do they need? What do we need to, what does our resolution need to contain so that we can. So so we have people that work on all of that. We've got bond counsel, uh, we've got consultants and uh, our financial advisors that, you know, once we, once we know that this is a direction we want 
to go in. We would go back. I would work with the city manager's office, the budget department, and the departments then to start compiling the specifics that we need to start narrowing down the amounts and which projects would actually be included in this. And so this is sort of where we um, – what we were doing today is sort of giving you sort of the big picture of this is kind of where we're thinking council wants to go once we get more direction from council as to this is what we're sort of looking at then we would work on coming back with you with with a plan so by june we need to have a sense of like what are the projects what's in what are the numbers right so we need right. to have that kind yes. of specificity yeah. yes All right so we're going to go ahead and take a break to grab lunch and uh it's 12 52 so let's Council, um, we can just get ours and come back in. And uh, the opera presentation is actually not a long presentation. It'll allow us to get to our um, last two major pieces for today. All right. So I'll give us, uh, let's come back at uh, 105. Thank you all.